thing. Okay, sorry, I was muted. So hopefully people on Zoom can hear me now. Oh, I guess. Oh, okay. oh, is this better? Okay, great. I told Dan he was allowed to make jokes in my expense. Sorry. Hi, welcome to the iFi Colloquium. We're delighted to have Yoni Khan returning. Uh, Yoni was a student at MIT, uh, a PhD student here, worked with Jesse, and I guess I also worked with him, but um, as a fellow student. Anyway, Yoni has moved, since moved on. He's now a professor at UIUC, and he's going to give us a talk um, about dumb machine learning for physics, which I'm excited to hear about. So go ahead. Thanks. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and the first thing that I want to say is that um, I am very much a novice to this field. Um, I have exactly one paper in the field of machine learning, though you'll hear about a lot of work in progress. Um, and so, you know, when I give a title like dumb machine learning for physics, it's actually not meant to be pejorative. It's meant to say like, look, I'm new to this. I want to understand like the simplest thing. So we're going to play with a bunch of like really simple toy examples and kind of see what happens. And then hopefully that'll generate some interesting dis discussions and you know I'd love to come back at some point and have more in-depth conversations with all of you that are, are really experts in this stuff okay um oops okay so you know I'll just start with um like all of the amazing things that have happened in AI in like the last couple of years um you know so like the first example is me typing explain the concept of time dilation to a five-year-old into chat GBT and it gave me like a perfectly serviceable answer you know I'm not sure if I could have done better if I was like, locked in a room and I had like an hour to do this um you know you Alpha fold can predict protein structure. You can generate images from text prompts, and then you can uh, beat professional humans at poker and make a lot of money. Um, so it seems like there's something amazing happening, um, and you know there's new tools that are impressing, they're giving really impressive performance on an almost daily basis. Um, and so part of my interest in this, um, and I you know credit Dan Roberts with getting me interested in this field to begin with, is these tools are doing amazing things. And as physicists, we're empiricists, and once we see something interesting or amazing happen, we want to understand why. So Part of my interest in this is not so much to come up with the best mousetrap, but just to like understand why the mousetrap works in the first place. So um, just a quick summary of the highlights of what's happened in the last 10 years of, of deep learning in industry. Um, so as far as I understand, things really got started in 2013, um, kind of a combination of implementing tools that had been developed back in the 1980s with really much better processing power. Um, able to win this ImageNet um, image recognition competition with an error rate that was like twice as good as, as anybody else. This happened while I was in grad school, but I was totally unaware of it. Um, and then gradually, I think the knowledge is kind of filtered into both the popular press and also um, the field of physics. Uh, three years later, you know, you had um, a computer with zero prior knowledge beating the world's best Go player who has since retired, said there's no point in me being in this um, anymore because a computer can do it better than I can. Um, and then, of course, I think we've all heard of uh, ChatGPT, whose predecessor is um, already three years old. That can generate text indistinguishable from from human responses, um, at, at, at least in some cases. Um, so this is all really, really awesome and amazing stuff. And you know, the diagrams here are some examples of um, the network architectures that are used to do these amazing things, which are which are not really simple by any means. Um, you know, here you have a convolutional neural network, um, and here there's sort of a, a reinforcement learning with different networks learning policies and values, and then the transformer architecture that was responsible for all the natural the natural language stuff has gotten really uh, amazing. Um, so I want to contrast that with um, what deep learning has looked like in a physics example, which is collider physics. Um, and so this amazed me that um, I guess the first paper on classifying jets with neural networks goes back to 1990, which is like only two years after like Jan LeCun came up with the idea for, for convolutional neural nets, but nobody could implement them because um, we didn't have the processing power. But their idea is just some fully connected network to do, you know, classify quark and gluon jets. Um, then, you know, 2017, so that's 27 years later, um, the idea that, oh, well, we have all these amazing tools for image recognition. Well, you can map a jet into an image space by just imagining the energy deposit in your calorimeter looking like a pixelated picture. Let me use the same techniques to do image classification, and, and that does pretty well. Um, and then a year later, our own Jesse Thaler pointed out that you can actually get better performance by just chaining together two of the much simpler neural networks that were of the architecture that was predicted to work on this task way back in the uh, in the 1990s. So this is not a totally fair apples to apples comparison, 
but just to make the point that like something funny seems to have happened where there is an idea proposed and then you know the idea for importing some tool from industry kind of worked but then like stepping back and using an even simpler tool seemed to work even better so that's an interesting phenomenon that i'm going to return to again and again in the talk um and so to start with my provocative uh, questions, where is our chat GPT or AlphaGo in physics? In other words, when has AI done something amazing for us that we could not have imagined doing? Sorry, I should say, when has deep learning done something amazing for us? Because the collider physicists will quite rightly tell us that we've been using AI for years and years in the form of like boosted decision trees. But I want to focus specifically on deep learning, which is kind of the phase transition that happened in industry. So where is our analogous example of like an amazing thing that happened that could not have happened without deep learning? Um, and one hope was that this LHC Olympics challenge would, would illustrate the power of, of deep learning techniques to do model independent anomaly detection. So I'm just screenshotting things from this, um, this um, very nice review from reports of progress in physics. You don't have to read all of it. The point was the challenge was as follows. So there are three data sets um, that have different sets of four vectors that represent possible events at, um, at colliders. Um, and they have a bunch of background stuff and some signal that you're supposed to try to find. Uh, box number one had some heavy resonance de decaying into two other things that then decayed the jets that had exactly the same event topology as um, an, an R&D kind of practice data set that was you, you, were, you were told where the anomaly was. Um, box two had nothing. So the challenge there is don't accidentally find an anomaly that's not actually there. Um, and box number three had two different decay channels with roughly equal branching fractions, which is sort of the hardest thing to find if, if you don't give yourself any prior knowledge. Um, so um, this report goes through a bunch of different ideas that were proposed and their results on this challenge. So let's see how we did. Um, in box number one, um, so here are some plots of the predictions for these different particle masses, the numbers of signals event, number uh, of signal events that are predicted. Um, and really only a single one of the um, submitted um, uh, algorithms was able to find both the correct mass of these new um, uh, particles and the number of events uh, corresponding to them. Everything else, as you can see, the people that decided to put error bars were, were, I think, being pretty realistic. Like the tiny, tiny error bars and just how far they are off from the true answers. Um, I think you know gives, should, should give us a little bit of pause. You know, this is like you know twenty or thirty sigma error bars on on basically every parameter of this model for for most of the ideas that were submitted. Okay, um, what about box number two? Um, no submitted algorithm had the confidence to say there is nothing in box number two. Again, maybe we should worry a little bit. You know, if we're in the business of trying to find new things in the LHC, we should find new things and not not kind of spurious signals. And so, you know, very I think um, uh, diplomatically, the way this was put is these results highlight a possible vulnerability of anomaly detection methods in the tails of, of distributions. It's a very fair statement. Um, and I think maybe the, the most frustrating case is box number three, which is that even after opening the box, even after telling you what's in there, none of the submitted algorithms were able to find the correct parameters. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Since my algorithm is on, like in the middle of that sentence, um, I, I, I should say that the, this was written by theorists who don't seem to interpret data correctly, and it's not your fault. Okay. Um, but, but, the, if if you quote a p-value on a range, look elsewhere effect will tell you that you'll have one greater than two sigma access. Okay, that's exactly what we saw. Okay, and the statement was that there was no signal. And in fact, if you sorry, no, you're talking about box number two. Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. So okay, so going going back. Okay, so at least okay. Uh, this is sorry. Uh, this is so. This is the absence of signals digest reported. Okay. Yeah, I mean okay. it's straight up. Like you, you never say there's no signal. You quote a p-value on the likelihood for that is nobody actually quoted any significant signal in there. And, fair enough. Fair enough. And and you know some some theorists say oh two sigma was a signal, um, which is not. Um, but I also think that the LHC Olympics were like it. It was kind of evil to make a box with nothing, um, especially as the second box because. Uh, then you get stuck on box number two because you don't find anything. You spend weeks and weeks and weeks. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I, that's another point. But I, I just yeah. want to like disagree with the statement that we found ecstasies right in box number two, even though we shouldn't have. Absolutely, absolutely fair. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thanks. Um, so um, I I think the point still stands in the sense that if we're doing anomaly detection, we should be able to find or not find the same anomalies as a bunch of different. Uh, different techniques. What we're, what we're trying to do in physics should be quantifiable and reproducible. And I think that's part of what Phil is getting at, that like the 
extent to which you can quote an uncertainty on your results is extremely important. And that's actually a, a point that I'm going to return to over and over in the talk. Um, so maybe the lesson is we should come up with a better LHC Olympics that has, you know, that, that, that is kind of more fair to these, these ideas. But really, you know, a, a miraculous tool would be, you know, you just write your thing ahead of time, you just hit enter and run, and it just tells you the results that, you know, um, that, that are in this exercise. I think that would really convince the community that we're, we're on the right track to finding something. Okay. Um, so I now want to go back to, to the positive, which is that, that deep learning has actually made discoveries in physics. Um, so maybe I'll be a little bit generous with my definition of, of discovery. So the Higgs was discovered in the diphoton channel and then the, the golden channel of um, uh, uh, gauge bosons to, um, to four leptons. But neural networks were able to find us the Higgs again in the BB bar channel, which is notoriously hard because just QCD jets, there's just tons of backgrounds. So you need a really, really, really good B tagger. What was the B tagger? It was a fully connected four layer uh, feed forward network. Um, obviously, just by eye, you can see that there's better performance um, uh, compared to a boosted decision tree. Um, so again, this is fantastic. Um, then also, uh, Lena Deceeb, um, one of my um, grad school um, co-students and uh, now faculty here, found this stellar stream um, you have these stars that kind of a very clustered phase space distribution in the Gaia data using, once again, a fully connected five layer neural network. Um, so what this is telling me is we can actually make discoveries using deep learning and physics, but the place where the discoveries have happened, and maybe this is just a function of a lag between industry and, um, and physics, but the place where the discoveries have happened has been in kind of the simplest possible neural network architecture. So there's at least three possible explanations. Um, so so one of the, you know, where, where is our miraculous example in physics? Well, maybe one of them is that people in the industry are just smarter or more clever or more competent than physicists. Um, I think I'm talking to an audience of mostly physicists. I think just by, you know, um, my own ego, I can say that's probably not the answer. But also there's, you know, a large diffusion of physicists into AI. So we're really talking about effectively the same community of people. Maybe they have access to kind of better training or better, better tools, which gets to number two. So, you know, Dan brought this point home to me that maybe physics is just compute limited. Maybe the reason we're not doing this well is we just don't have enough computing power because all the money and all the GPUs and TPUs are going to industry. Um, actually, amusingly, this paper came out about four days ago um, from science showing a plot of exactly that sort of its computing power um, uh, measured by number of model parameters. Um, and you can just see that academia just kind of flatlines. Um, if a company gives you some GPUs, you do a little bit better, but of course they're gonna keep all the best stuff for, them, for themselves. Maybe this is important. I, I'm not sure. Again, I don't have answers to any of these questions. I just want to pose them in, you know, sort of as questions for discussion. Um, but the point that I want to focus on is maybe it's that physics data is just different in both a qualitative and quantitative way than kind of the data in the wild that these really miraculous machine learning tools are, um, are, are being used for. And I think I can convince you of at least part of the answer to that question, um, which is here's two ways that physics is, data is probably different from data in the wild. Uh, number one is that physics data tends to live on manifolds. Um, any collection of four vectors is going to live on the Lorentz invariant phase space manifold. Any collection of positions and velocities of astronomical objects is going to live on some symplectic manifold that represents classical phase space. Um, so what is the manifold of the set of cat images? Uh, I just have no idea. I mean, it would be really nice if such a thing existed, but we definitely don't have a, a generative model from first principles for cat images like we do for, say, um, you know, parton level uh, uh, um, collider physics data. And the other thing is that we care about uncertainty quantification. And so this is that now to get back to, to Phil's point. Um, so this is just an illustration of I typed the prompt physics data into stable diffusion. Um, and you can't see, but like, well, stable diffusion can't really do words. So it just gave you like aerosols plots that were labeled with physics data where the words physics and data are not really words. Um, and like four different kind of looking plots. And I'm like, huh, okay, so one prompt, four images, right? If I'm just like looking for some clip art, I would just pick the best one and throw away the others. But like, what is the variance that tells me why the one problem gives me four different images? These are very different images. Like, where is that uncertainty coming from? Um, versus, you know, if you want to claim a discovery, you better have a Brazil plot with one and two sigma, um, you know, confidence bands. Otherwise, nobody's going to believe you. So maybe that's less about physics data and more about the way that we use data in physics. But any tool that we use to do an analysis should probably be able to respect at least these two, um, uh, these two features. Okay, so. What do I mean by dumb machine learning? I mean, deep learning was just a simple feed forward neural network. Um, so as um, Dan and collaborators have pointed out in this really, really uh, nice book um, that I've been um, studying at least for the past year or two and, and learning a heck of a lot about the field, there's already an incredible amount of structure in a fully connected network. Um, it is not the state-of-the-art tool, but maybe it doesn't need to be. And I think it's 
great to try to understand this tool before jumping to fancier things, um, because we already have a lot to learn just about the statistics of, of, of networks drawn from distributions of, uh, of this architecture. So um, the talk is just going to be a series of illustrative examples. Again, I'm not going to answer any of these questions. I'm just going to point out curious phenomena that I've observed in my kind of novice, you know, random walk through this territory of machine learning. Um, a couple of examples of tools that seem to succeed at a hard problem but fail at an easier one. Um, and then a set of um, uh, qualitative analyses that, that, that point towards a way to control fluctuations in, in feed forward networks that if you want to, you know, tamp down the variance of possible answers you can get, you probably want to reduce the variance of the network output with respect to the number of times you initialize the network. That would be a good thing to do. Um, and then also some very, very recent and preliminary stuff on the best way to balance your model size and, and data inspired by um, investigations into these large language models that are the engines behind things like ChatGPT. Um, so the, the unifying themes of this talk are ensemble variants. You know, if you run 100 neural networks, what is the spread in the 100 answers that you get? Um, but also the dimensionality of your data. These things might ma matter more in physics applications than, um, than in industry. So um, I should say that I'm, you know, this is a colloquium, but I'm happy to like take questions as, you know, as Phil was asking throughout the talk. So um, I'm happy to maybe pause here uh, if people have questions. Otherwise, I can um, keep going and, and get to them as we go. Okay. So, um, so this is now my, you know, one and only machine learning paper. Um, as we looked at autoencoders uh, for doing anomaly detection. Um, so an autoencoder is just a fully connected network where you have um, a layer in the middle that is smaller than your input or your output. Um, it needs to be smaller because you don't want it to learn the trivial identity function on all your data. You want it to learn the identity function on just your training data and garbage everywhere else. So the idea is that you're compressing the data to something that people sometimes call the intrinsic dimension of your data. You know, hold that thought. I'm going to come back to that by the end of the talk. Um, and then you uncompress it, and your loss is just a function of your input minus your input. So you want to match your input as best as possible on your training data, but not on things that you didn't give it as part of the training set. Um, and so the idea is that maybe an anomaly is something that has poor reconstruction, that has large loss. So once you train this thing, you feed it an out of distribution data point, it gives you a large loss, and you say, ah, oh, that thing is probably anomalous with respect to my training set. Um, and there are many ideas in the literature for using this architecture to do model independent anomaly detection, in particular, say, looking at anomalous jets or trying to do this, this jet classification task. So, you know, in the spirit of stupid examples, we step back and said, well, look, you know, can, can an autoencoder learn, say, a two sphere? So give it the two sphere embedded in R3, that's, you know, uh, three data points, have it go to some very, very wide layers and compress it to two dimensions. The sphere is two dimensional, so obviously it should do a perfect job, right? Uh, well, actually, the sphere has topology. You can't map the sphere to a plane, or you can, but it breaks at at least one point. And that map is called stereographic projection. It's the reason that Greenland looks really, really big on all your maps. Um, and so the picture on the left is showing you I have a uniform, uniformly sampled two sphere um, as my, um, my training set. Um, I have another uniformly sampled two sphere as a test set. And this is the model output. And you can kind of see this little hole punched in the sphere up there. Um, you can now map that on, on like a mole weed projection, um, and you can plot the, the test loss, and you see that points kind of in that region get thrown all over the place. Um, so this, the neural network is learning to punch the sphere open at a point. Interesting fact, if you run it 100 times, you'll get 100 different points. Just randomly on the sphere, it'll decide where to, where to break this map. Um, and a nice way to illustrate that is to plot the loss as a function of the Euclidean distance to the largest loss point. If you see that thing fall off, that tells you the loss is localized near a point. It's not kind of ripping the manifold apart everywhere. It's just punching a hole in it. Um, but if you were to try to interpret this as anomalous, you would say, oh, that point has really large loss. That's probably anomalous, right? But it, it's not. It's just a random point on the sphere. The topology of your data told you that this had to happen. So you have to correct for this somehow. OK, so now, now let's talk about um, uh, giving it a training set that has um, some anomalous region XI. So let, let me say that I want the equator of the sphere to be my anomalous region. So I'm going to give it a training set where the region around those green bands is XI. So I'm not going to give it the equator. I'm going to give it the upper and lower hemispheres. Um, and then I'll just ask on a test set uniformly sampled from the sphere, what is my loss? Um, and the only difference is that the place where the map breaks lies on the part of the test, the training set you excluded but it interpolates everyone else, right? So you've now punched the sphere on the equator, but diametrically across on the equator, there's no loss, everything looks fine. So here it's failing to find an anomaly um, because these neural networks have an inductive bias towards interpolation. So the neural network just wants to interpolate right through the equator, even if you didn't give it 
to the network as part of the training set. So you think that the submanifold should be anomalous, but your inductive bias tells you, no, 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 um, things that lie on submanifolds are never going to be classified as, as anomalous, except maybe in the neighborhood of an isolated point. Um, and the problem is that the kind of anomaly detection you often want to do in physics, you're doing a bump hunt. A resonance in phase space is a submanifold of phase space. And so this already tells you you might have problems um, finding fake anomalies and failing to find real ones if you try to train an autoencoder on, on phase space. Um, so we did this. And so here's just a curious mathematical fact um, is that n particle phase space is a topological sphere. Um, so here is an example from, from three particle phase space. It's just, just a, a way of seeing this. Um, so energy is a convex function of, of your spatial momenta. Um, saying that your some of your energies is less than some value defines a ball in R9. And then conservation of momentum tells you you have some event plane that slices um, this uh, nine ball to form a six ball. And then the boundary of that thing tells you what your um, initial state energy was. And that gives you a, a boundary of a ball as a sphere. And so this is just some lower dimensional analog. If you have a, a, a three ball, so, so filling in the, the sphere, um, and you slice it by a plane, you got a, a circle, which is a, a disk, which is a two ball, whose boundary is a, is a one sphere. Um, so um, this is why it's nice to work with some uh, topologists um, <laughs> on, on these kinds of, because I, I think th this might have been known in the physics community, but it sort of wasn't framed in this language, because if you try to put coordinates on something, you often can't see the topology. Um, okay, so let's run the same uh, autoencoder architecture on, on points sampled from three particle phase space. That's a dimension five manifold is in fact a dimension five sphere. You can see that the same thing happens that, that if you run this autoencoder, the loss is localized uh, near the worst point. So it behaves like a sphere. Um, you can nicely map um, this thing down to this plane, this, this Dalitz triangle where or there's a, um, an SO3 uh, worth of directions over e um, the order angles rotating the event plane over each point. Um, the fact that you um, uh, it looks like weird things happen to the corners is actually misleading because if you plot the five worst points you can't see from just sampling a thousand random points, they just kind of sit at random points in the interior of this triangle. So again, your neural network is learning to kind of punch your five sphere at a random point, and you don't want that thing to be anomalous because again, it's just a it's just a random point. Um, and then the analogy with um, the uh, the submanifold, the anomalous submanifold is is a hunt in say leptons, like you're looking for, you know, a, an anomalous, uh, something that decays to, I don't know, E plus E minus gamma at your collider. Um, you can pretty much measure all components of the four vector of that thing. It's not really going to shower or hadronize. Um, and so the submanifold of phase space where your, your anomaly lives on is going to be um, a slice in this Dalitz plane where the invariant mass of two particles equals some, some value. So let's exclude that from the training set. You train the autoencoder. Um, and once again, you just break this map from the sphere to R5 at a random point that's close to the excised region. And now, if you give it a test set that only contains points in that submanifold, you should say those things should be anomalous as you get enormous loss, um, but you don't. It just interpolates straight through. You can look at um, your, your, um, a, a test set consisting of regions around that excised region or just sitting inside that thing, and the loss tails are just in indistinguishable. Um, so our point in writing this paper was not to say like autoencoders can never work for anomaly detection, but in this case, a property of your data, namely the topology, um, is important and can lead you to misidentify anomalies either as type one or type two errors um, if you don't account for this. Okay. Um, so that so the the kind of succeeding on a hard task and failing on an easy one is like these autoencoders have been shown to work kind of pretty well for for QCD jets, but like. One should think that leptons are easier than, than, than jets, but here's a tool that seems to fail on the, um, the simpler example. Okay, yeah, question. Yeah, so I, I'd like to ask about like this, uh, the exercise of just removing one uh, submanifold yeah. in like as sort of a baseline, because like in the, in the context of, of anomaly uh, finding, I would expect the anomalous uh, like scenario to have sort of a more non-trivial information like a bump um, in, in, in whatever. You, you want a distribution on invariant masses and not just a delta function. Um, no, I'm saying that, yeah, that it is like, it is like contains more information or more non-trivial. So, so shape. that might, so Jesse and I have talked about this, that might be the case for jets. It is just explicitly not the case when your data is just four vectors. Okay, right, okay. a bump hunt in E plus E minus gamma, where you know all four, or all four components of the four vector, is simply the submanifold where the invariant mass of a pair of those things is fixed. 
It's just a line on that Dalit's plane. Okay, okay. So unfortunately, the only information you have is, is the distribution of points inside that region. And we tried that and the same thing happens. Okay, so. okay thank you. Um, so this seems like it's in the context of outlier detection in terms of anomaly, uh, looking for anomalies. Um, have you thought at all about how any of this works in the context of like using density estimation to look for anomalies, for example? Does topology affect anything in that case? So I, I think it must because you just can't get away from topology. Like you, you can't map the sphere into Rn. Um, and the fact that phase space is a topological sphere um, seems to be an important aspect of this. Um, and I think the particular implementation, like that's just going to manifest itself somehow no matter, no matter what. I think maybe the bigger point is, is what do you mean by anomaly? And this particular tool is very bad at detecting submanifolds. If you want your anomalies to live on a submanifold, it's just going to have problems for exactly this, uh, this reason. Thank you. Yeah. Um, OK, so um, now switching gears totally, um, let's talk about classical phase space. Um, by which I mean, say, positions and velocities of a bunch of stars. So we have all this amazing data from the Gaia satellite. Um, say that we have full six-dimensional phase space information for, I don't know, 100,000, million, billion, whatever stars. Can we figure out what the gravitational potential is that these things are orbiting in? Um, and this is such a good idea that two groups basically simultaneously came out with the, the same um, uh, architecture for doing it. Um, the idea is that there's a tool called a normalizing flow that is some um, uh, unsupervised uh, tool whose job is to figure out the distribution from which your data points are drawn from. Um, and so you can implement that um, via a neural network with some modifications. And then once you have your estimated phase space density, you can self-consistently figure out what the potential is by solving the Boltzmann equation. One of these groups does it by using a second fully connected network or, or MLP to just do that for you. And another group does it by realizing you can look at some sort of loss and kind of analytically minimize it. You can get some matrix that you can then numerically infer. Um, and then if you look at uh, the, the, um, the plots in these papers, see, things seem to work really well. So the idea of normalizing flows is you take some distribution that's easy to sample from, like a Gaussian, and you learn the Jacobian, which is some invertible map that transforms you into the, dis the distribution you want. And it's a highly multidimensional thing, so you want some flexible function approximator like a neural network to learn that Jacobian. Um, and um, as long as the Jacobian isn't singular, uh, you can always do this. And the reason it's called a normalizing flow is that maybe you want to chain together a bunch of these to just kind of get more expressive power in, in the class of distributions that you can learn. Um, there's various ways you have to implement this. It's basically a feed forward network plus something. And that something is this weight masking that basically enforces that your probability distribution can learn correlated functions of variables rather than a product of independent distributions. Um, and both these groups tried some, some toy examples. So here's some kind of face face data with a lot of streams and cusps it looked like it would be pretty hard to, to reconstruct and it seems kind of by eye you kind of can't tell the difference between the training data and the output um this other paper was sampling kind of uh some mock gaia catalog data even smeared with errors and then you look at the output and it's basically indistinguishable from um from your your training data and then you think wow this this seems to work really well um but once again being kind of the novices that we were where we said okay let's just try again the dumbest example sort of like equation 1.1 from one of these papers Let's take a um, effectively uh, a, a one-dimensional distribution, so a spherically symmetric thing called a plumber sphere, where you know the uh, the density and the potential, and then you can have just some analytic function on phase space that tells you how you generate that potential and density. Um, and let's train both these architectures in exactly the same way as was listed in these papers and see what happens. Um, in one case, they use this 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 one kind of masking scheme, the details of which are not important. Um, but the idea is you should look at the difference between the solid line. Um, and the dots, which is what you get by training one of these networks and then trying to predict the potential. Um, and it does, I would say, very poorly. Um, you can then do that 16 times in average. So basically, you, you train 16 different normalizing flows. You just average the phase space densities, and then you feed that into your network that predicts the potential, and it, and it does better. Um, you know, it's still not um, uh, really matching it at, um, at, at large radii. There might be some problem with outliers. Um, so there's something happening with ensemble variance. You, you need to average the prediction from many instantiations of your network in order to get something reasonable. Um, you can try the same thing with this other masking scheme. Um, and there we saw a different kind of avatar of ensemble variance. Just two different runs gave you two different local minima of the loss, neither of which really reproduced the training data very well. One of them kind of in one variable undershot and one of them overshot. Which one is better? I don't, I don't know. I mean, they have different values of the loss, which is some sort of maximum likelihood estimator, but like, you know, maybe I have some prior on my distributions where I prefer to just get the mean value right and I don't really care about the tails. 
I don't know, this kind of tool can't really tell us. But all it's saying is that if you train a network 10 times, you could get 10 different answers and the spread of those answers is pretty important. This is work with uh, Victoria Tiki, who's uh, visiting here and uh, Jesse Shelton um, that will hopefully appear uh, in the next couple months. So um, here's a, another picture of ensemble variants that actually comes from our autoencoder paper to kind of tie these two things together. Um, so consider the following math exercise. Um, the torus can be embedded in R4 as a product of two circles. So I just, X and Y is a circle, Z and W is a circle. And I know that there is an embedding of the torus into three dimensions that's a donut. So on the right, that's what a donut looks like. So if I have an autoencoder whose input dimension is four and whose sort of latent dimension is three, there exists a differentiable map from R4 to R3 that is guaranteed to be able to find this with zero loss. So there, there is a, a global minimum of the loss and I am giving my network enough capacity to find it. It finds it occasionally. If you train a network 20 times, maybe one out of 20, we didn't really quantify this too much just as an illustrative example, but 19 times out of 20, it fails to connect the two circles. That's kind of a global aspect of the topology that's kind of hard to do. And so our conclusion is that this embedding exists, but it's kind of sparse in the space of all differentiable functions. So the network kind of rarely finds it. So this is just another example of, of ensemble variance. You know, what is, what is driving the fact that if I run this network 20 times with the same data points, I get these two qualitatively different answers. So I'd like to figure out the answer to that question before I try to use these, um, these tools. Okay. Um, and just one interesting point that's going to lead into the next section of my talk um, is that um, this paper from uh, a couple of years ago made the point that just because your network is analytically invertible, that might not mean that it's numerically invertible. Um, so in particular, if you pass a data point through your normalizing flow network and the norm of that data point tends to blow up, that means that running the map backwards is going to give you an almost singular Jacobian. Um, and almost singular up to numerical errors might be just as bad as singular. So this is just some example of like trying to run a normalizing flow on this image data. And just the garbage pixels are just NANs that are indicative of this, this, um, uh, this reconstruction error that comes from some large ensemble variance. If you can't control the typical size of inputs going through your network, you might not be able to invert your network even though you need to. Um, and I'll just point out that, that this is probably not the source of the things that we were seeing in the previous plots, but I think it's an interesting point to pay attention to and, and maybe one that hasn't been um, uh, really emphasized in using these normalizing flows to do these, um, these physics problems. Okay, so, so with that jumping off point, so I now wanna go back to just my dumb machine learning vanilla MLP architecture um, and uh, review some of um, Dan's really nice work on estimating the, um, the, the distribution of, of network outputs ensembling over different initializations. Um, so just to, to put the notation out there, so Zs are gonna be the pre-activation, so what goes into the activation function at each layer of this network. Um, that's your evolution equation where you apply an activation function sigma. Um, and I'm going to drop all the indices um, and I'll just call all the parameters of the network just, just theta to kind of show these things schematically. Um, and the setup is imagine you initialize an ensemble of networks, drawing all your parameters from independent Gaussians. And then you train with ordinary gradient descent. So that's the setup. So you do this. So you, you have some distribution for all your weights and biases at um, all these layers that are, that are Gaussians. And you can fix the variance of those things and give them mean zero. You instantiate 100 networks. You just let the things go. And you ask, what is the spread in my possible predictions um, at the end of the network? Um, and so one thing that was noticed um, uh, in, in uh, a couple of papers, um, so some of them starting back in, in 2017, and then, and then um, uh, Dan Collaborate has kind of filled in some important details, um, is that you can choose your uh, variance of your network distribution parameters in a smart way to prevent things from either blowing up or dying exponentially. Um, so one object is this expectation value of D of pre-activation by parameter. Um, this is something called the neural tangent kernel or the, or the NTK. And this is that controls how observables update during one step of training. Um, and it was pointed out back in 2017 that what you'd like to do is if you choose um, the um, relationship between your weight variance and your bias variance along that line, you're kind of right on the boundary between either vanishing gradients or exploding gradients where vanishing or exploding mean exponentially. So along that line, at worst, things are blowing up or, or, or dying like a power law. Um, and then Dan pointed out that actually there's another thing that you need to consider, which is the typical norm of the output. So forget the D output by D parameter, just ask what is the norm of a vector as I pass it through my network? 
Um, if you tune that thing so it doesn't blow up exponentially or, or die exponentially, actually you get another curve and the intersection of those curves nails for you exactly the, um, the critical initialization hyperparameters that prevent things from, um, um, from exploding. Um, and this is an activation function dependent statement. So depending on whether your activation function is like a ReLU or a Tanch, there's different choices for these things. And you want to choose activations that admit these critical initializations. It's kind of just a precursor to trying to do useful things with your network. Um, and you know, one of the main conclusions from, from Dan's book is that all of the network statistics um, beyond the infinite width gauge statistics scale as the ratio of L, which is the depth, to N, which is the number of neurons per layer or, or the width. Um, some things that scale with L are good. Um, this is what schematically one update to second order in the learning rate eta does during gradient descent. Um, and that object right there, the statistics of that object grow with L over N. And so that is what lets you do things like feature learning. That, that's what lets neurons uh, wire together and, and update the random features of your network that, that, that are kind of given to you at um, initialization. Um, however, some things just add noise. So the connected four point correlator of pre-activations also scales um, with depth. And so that just increases your variance without doing anything useful for you. So an interesting fact is um, if you instead draw your weights from an orthogonal matrix, so now you have to make all the layers of your network the same width. And so the weight matrix that goes from layer L to layer L plus one, if you make that thing an orthogonal matrix, large N orthogonal matrices are basically independent Gaussians with subtle one over N correlators between entries. Um, and that kind of magically fixes things up for you. And this is kind of pointed out in a bit of a roundabout way um, in, in one of the same papers by the same authors from, um, from Google Brain, um, that for certain choices of activation function, you can make your network output variance be independent of depth. You can make it as deep as you want and it won't even grow linearly. Um, you can only do that for linear activations and tanch activations. You can't do that for, for, um, for ReLU activations. And so they suggested actually, so the title of this paper was Resurrecting the Sigmoid. So like, Everybody uses ReLUs these days, but actually maybe we should go back and use the sigmoid activation. By sigmoid, they actually mean tanch um, because you can keep variance under control with a suitable choice of initialization. Um, and then in some very, very recent work, these plots are like two days old um, by my student Hannah Day, uh, we worked out the other correlators in Dan's paper. And it turns out with orthogonal initializations, all of the bad ones, quote, quote, the things that just add variance end up being independent of depth and all the good ones grow linearly. So this is sort of, suggestive that maybe this is a better initialization to keep variants under control. Um, there are many things that remain to be investigated. So Dan mentioned to me yesterday, we should try to compare this thing with things like, um, like batch norm or, or layer norm, other ways of kind of, you know, by hand controlling the, the variance of, um, of information through the network. Um, but this is the kind of investigation that might help us in physics if we can quantitatively um, predict our network variants without having to ensemble over a thousand networks, especially if they're expensive to train. That would be great because we could figure out what architecture we wanted from the beginning. Okay, um, so for the last set of examples, um, I wanna um, go back to the idea of, of data dimension and then return to this example of, uh, of collider data. Um, and so I, I borrowed this really beautiful plot from, from Eric Matodia, uh, one of Jesse's students. Um, and um, so just to remind, if you have N particles, um, they live on some Lorentz invariant phase space manifold um, of dimension three N minus four, um, three N for the three spatial coordinates and minus four for the, um, uh, the uh, energy and momentum conservation constraints. Um, but if you have a colored object like a quark or a gluon, it hadronizes, and so it makes more particles. And so the dimension of your phase space manifold changes as a function of energy scale. And you start with some collision, you make one hard particle that's actually negative one dimensional phase space. Um, uh, you can imagine a two to two collision that's somewhat more reasonable. That's just two dimensional, it's just the direction those things come in that lives on a sphere. That's the only information you have. But then each of those guys is going to fragment, it's going to hadronize. And each of those is going to get you more and more particles. Um, so somehow the original information about the manifold the collision lives on is kind of hidden inside this much, much larger phase space manifold of all the particles you're producing along with your jet. And then, of course, the thing hits a detector, and now you have to pixelate. Um, you have to use the bin, your, your energies and angles, and you know calorimeter cells. So you have to unfold for these effects. So the manifold gets distorted a little bit. Um, but the key point from this picture is just that what you mean by the dimension of your data depends on what energy scale or distance scale you're, you're looking at. Um, and this is actually not, not so different from, you know, data in the wild. If I have like, in, you know, a picture of a cat um, and it's really, really, really heavily pixelated, maybe all I can tell is like, is there a face or not? But if I look at finer scales, like are there ears? I look at even finer scales, are there whiskers? And so each of those can have some orientation. So the dimension of an image 
it actually does kind of make sense that such a thing would, would scale with the, the resolution that I can look at the thing with. Um, and this analogy was um, was pushed forward by this, this paper from 2015. Um, so this on the left is a jet image. So this is the color represents the amount of energy deposited in a certain direction on your calorimeter at your, at your detector. Um, and that's a pixelated image of a cat from the CIFAR um, image uh, uh, data Tessa. Um, and um, so again, inspired by um, some, some work that Dan did looking at um, uh, large language models, you can form the data data covariance matrix. So you see how correlated is you know, pixel one of the first image with pixel one of the second image. Um, and you can plot the eigenvalue spectrum of that matrix. Um, when you do that for image data from CIFAR, you see this really beautiful power law that kind of tails off. Um, where the size of the the extent of the power law depends on how many um, images are in your training set. Um, just for fun, we did the same thing with a couple of simulated jet images, or the same same data set size, and you kind of see the same power law spectrum. So you might look at this and say, "That's cool." So jet images really are like cat images. So it does make sense to use the image recognition tools on uh, on this task. Um, but um, if you look quantitatively at how well um, these techniques do on, on this classification task. So say your goal is to classify a jet that came from a quark from a jet that came from a gluon. Um, Jesse's paper um, from, from 2019 on energy flow networks pointed out that linear regression on a set of engineered features, which are these energy flow polynomials, outperforms this convolutional neural network architecture, which is sort of tailor-made for image recognition. Contrast that with like this image net classification task, but this is the architecture that was used, which is pretty complicated. And things have only gotten more complicated from there, but they've only gotten better. So all of the state-of-the-art networks from the year 2013 on use convolutional neural nets at some stage in order to do image classification. And you do, in fact, just do better and better and better. So something in here is telling you that actually looking in kind of pixel space is not the right set of variables to be studying, um, uh, to be studying jets because it Sure. All right. Sorry. Uh, doing a replacement mic situation. Oh, uh, can you? Um... So in both these cases, the number of images or like the data that is used to train are very different, right? So uh, it, could it be the case that in the quark versus gluon case, you might have a limited amount of training data and hence the load Deep, like you know, techniques like uh, simpler techniques outperform. Is that could it, that be a case? It might be, but I don't think. How many images are in the CIFAR set? Fifty thousand. That's not that many. And how much? How many images do you have? Uh, you know? I don't remember how many you, you use in this paper. Yeah, it's basically the, the training set. So I'm going to get to how efficient these things are as a function of training set size. But I think actually this is a a pretty fair comparison. Um, and in this example, as a function of training set size. Okay. Okay. So another way to look at the data dimension um, was um, was suggested in in Dan's paper by looking at. And now this gets to your question: the loss in your task, whether it be classification or um, or language modeling or whatever, as a function of training set size t. So here. Um, N means the number of parameters in your model, so number of weights and biases in your network, maybe. And T means the amount of data in your training set. Um, and what's been empirically observed, sorry. Yes, fair enough. OK, so, so I get, yeah. So um, I was actually going to mention that on, on this slide are a number of CTP alums. Sorry, I had the wrong reference is what Dan's telling me. Sorry, do you want to hear? Can you? <laughs> Just that this was a empirical observation made by Jerry Kaplan, Sam McCandlish, and OpenAI. It's not one of those papers. It's not the first Kaplan paper. No, that's a oh. theory paper. Okay, okay, okay. Um, but it was a it was, we didn't discover it, but it was, a, it was an empirical. Fair enough. So you you made a pretty plot that I can put on my. I plot, made a so. nice cartoon plot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. No, and, and again, so part part of you know you'll have to forgive me for being a novice in this in this area that I don't know all the right citations, and so I appreciate the the corrections because it's really important to give people credit uh, where credits due. Um. But the point is, what was observed is that there's a saturation in the loss. Um, and as your model grows, you do better and better, and that plateau drops and drops, and you kind of drop along this power law. Um, and for some tasks, it might be the case that the slope of this loss, the power law index, and the slope of that data covariance eigenvalue plot might be related, and they might measure the dimension of your data. 
but kind of only if your data manifold is roughly isotropic, which is like you have nearest neighbors kind of in all directions. Um, because as you increase your training set size, you're kind of filling in the nooks and crannies of your manifold and you're measuring more and more things. Um, and there's a nice way to visualize that, um, which is let's look at a two sphere again, just stupid examples versus an ant on a garden hose, right? This example might be familiar to physicists. This is how we explain curled up dimensions in string theory. You know, at very long distances, um, the ant only sees the linear dimension of the garden hose. But as you zoom in, you can go around the circle and so you see the second dimension. And one way of measuring this is this, this notion of a correlation dimension, which is a distance scale dependent dimension um, that basically counts the, the, the logarithmic slope of how many nearest neighbors you have. Um, so you can implement this thing in, in, in scikit dim, um, and that, that gives you some sort of average, like distance average correlation dimension. And if you plot that as a function of the data set size, for the two sphere and for cylinders with various aspect ratios, kind of getting from fatter to skinnier, you see the two sphere settles after 100 data points on the dimension of two, which is correct. Um, but the cylinder, you don't learn the second dimension until you get more and more and more data to really sample the, the circle part of the, of the cylinder. And another way to say this is, is now let's look at um, fix the data set size. And let's look at the, um, the correlation dimension as a function of um, the distance Q that you put in that, um, in that formula. Um, again, so for a sphere of radius one, you see you set on this plateau and then you drop off immediately because there's nothing that's, that's farther than, than uh, diameter apart. Um, but for the cylinder, you kind of sit at um, two at small distances, but once you get the large distances, you plateau back down to one because you only see the long linear dimension. Um, so this is the, the point about isotropy in your data manifold. Uh, high dimensional data is hard to visualize, but it's important to understand if you're trying to interpret these data dimension plots, to what extent is your data manifold or your feature manifold isotropic so you can correlate the, um, this notion of nearest neighbors to, um, to a slope of some, um, uh, some, some test loss. So to bring this back, yeah, so you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I had a lot of fun rereading papers um, by uh, by Jesse when I was preparing this this talk and starting to work on this because I think I'm actually Jesse's only student who never worked on jets, um, but you can't avoid it forever. Um, so now I'm back, um, and you know this is a really nice plot about doing like real physics on open data from um, from CMS, um, plotting the correlation dimension of of a jet where the distance is measured using this um, this um, energy movers distance. Um, compared to some predictions you can get from perturbative QCD and seeing that things actually match uh, pretty well. And what we like to understand and, and worked on doing with uh, Dan and also uh, Josh Batson, who is our collaborator on the topology paper, um, is to understand in this interesting example in physics, does the underlying geometry of your jet manifold govern a scaling law on the loss um, for some classification test like quark versus gluon classification? So for a fixed training set size, what's the best classifier? We already know that in some contexts, um, these uh, linear regression on, on EFPs works better than um, a convolutional neural net, but you know, maybe that's just a function of your training set size. You only had 100 training points, what would do better? Um, and then extending beyond that, what's the best way to jointly scale uh, your model and your training data? You know, I just kind of wonder naively, if we had access to all the data from the LEC, suppose we didn't throw anything away using the high-level trigger, um, could we actually get any more information out? Or are we just going to saturate at some point? In which case, that's useful information. It can tell you the maximum data taking grade that's actually going to teach you anything at your collider. Um, and just to come back to the point of the talk, you know, can we understand in what context maybe just an ordinary feed forward network with some sort of engineered features or some sort of priors built in that might actually be most efficient measured by best loss as a function of training set size um, or, or model size um, for doing a, a particular classification test? So again, I don't have answers to any of these questions, but, but this is the kind of stuff that I, I find myself interested in uh, nowadays. OK, so just to sum up, um, I've asked a lot of questions. I haven't, uh, I haven't answered many of them. Um, but I hope I've convinced you that we can get a lot of mileage out of this relatively simple seeming uh, architecture. Um, you know, we can find stellar streams. We can do jet tagging classification. Another thing that I'm working on with some experimentalists um, on Atlas um, at UIUC is, is neural networks for, for particle ID at future colliders. Um, and I think physicists have the tools to understand this structure because the formalism of correlation functions and ensembles is very familiar to us. Um, and then we can use it reliably. If we can act, attach error bars to our neural network analysis, that would be great. And it would let people you know, trust our results more. Um, and so I, I want to encourage the, the community to, I think, uh, pursue questions along these lines. Um, and just to sum up, this is um, uh, a fun XKCD cartoon from a couple of years ago. He says, this is your machine learning system. And the answer is, yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. Uh, then the question is, what if the answers are wrong? 
And the response is just stir the pile until they start looking right. Um, so that's not a great way to quantify uncertainty. We should do better. Um, and um, I'm confident that as a community, we can. So thanks and happy to take questions. Uh, oh. Oh. You can still take advantage of this question. Yeah, I'm gonna. Well, yeah, I have a question for you. Um, so in the you showed the plot of jet images and it had a power law, and then you, you pointed out that uh, natural images also have a power law. Um, there's a big puzzle for me. Well, maybe someone else has the answer where that power law comes from. We don't have a model of where the general model of that images. We do have a general model of physics data. I mean, it, there's complicated steps that you showed in that. Diagram you stole from here. Maybe. Yeah. Um, do we have any hope of being able to derive where the power law comes from, given that we understand up to maybe QCD being hard of uh, the general model? So I, I think is, the answer is probably yes, though I haven't worked on this aspect of it. So if you're actually doing it in jet image space, you need to care about kind of the unfolding or the, the folding that goes from some collider, some sort of, you know, four vector level stuff to, to, to this picture. Um, so I'm not sure, but that would be interesting. And I don't know, maybe Jesse knows a better answer to that question. Um, yeah. Cool. But yeah, that, that would be a, a cool thing to, to, to try to predict. Yeah. This is not about the loss, right? This is not a, a task dependent notion of a, of a power law. It's just a, a statement about um, um, about these images. Well, the structure seems to arise in, in also natural language data sets. This seems to be what's the work that I did with Alex and, and Jamie. Um, the important ingredient for scaling laws. And so understanding where that comes from, even in a toy model, like um, where it's not put in by hand, it's yeah. pretty interesting. Well, one obvious difference between these things is that jet images are pretty sparse. Like there's relatively few pixels that have a lot of information. Um, so this. Sure, that's that's true. Okay, so maybe a better comparison is the slope of this versus the... Um, yeah, I don't carry yeah. any slope, just yeah. Yeah, to show where the power law comes from. Yeah. So if you go back to your your, your flat torus or torus example. So in the in the in the very beginning, you talk about topology as being an obstruction. Like that I understand. There's yeah. no way of finding it whatsoever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In in this case, where you say the right answer is rare, do you understand what's going on? Is this yeah. trapped in the local minimum? Or no, is this... Yeah, yeah. this is obviously a local minimum, and it's obviously a bad one. Um That's because the loss is just like the loss should be zero. That is a global minimum. And it, yes, it gets stuck there. But it's something about, you know, you, to find the map that correctly embeds. Like, if you try to embed a knot in free space, we did that example in our paper also. It failed very, very badly. If you give it a prior that you should have a, a prioritization of the knot where, where you can unroll it into a circle, it does a little bit better. But so there's, there's intrinsic and extrinsic topology. And they're both important, but one you can cure and one you can't. This is extrinsic topology, which is, which is hard, but not, not unsolvable. I guess part of my question is in these examples where you say, oh, it works for hard data sets, but isn't working for easier data sets. Is it just the people working on the hard data sets who trained it many more times, happen to find a, a deeper minimum and happen to report that in the literature? And and uh, maybe, but I would like to know what the variance of the distribution is. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's yeah, that's kind of that. I just like to know can I predict how often it's going to find that versus that? Also, obviously, a data set's not continuous. And so, even in the circle example, there's a bad point where we, I guess, you know, you only steer in the sphere example, right? We don't actually, the training set or the, the test set actually isn't, isn't, you know, continuous on the sphere. There's missing points. So if you have trained enough, they'll put the bad point, they'll put the, the, the break point somewhere between the points that you have. Oh, okay. Right. So you can't overtrain them and have it go away, but you'll still see the relic of it by those plots that you only showed where the distance, be, uh, like the, the points nearby will be still be mapped. Even like the actual data, like it can choose to break it in a place where it doesn't have any data points. So that's the sort of relic that you see. Thanks, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah, just related, right? I mean, my conclusion, or at least I'm trying to come to the conclusion from this these studies is that if you if you know that, let's say if I can embed everything in the torus, or I can like take the torus and like unroll it and put it on a you know surface. And I impose the constraint that I'm on the quarters, then the problem is solvable. Right? Yeah, I mean, so, so that's a great thing you should do is you try to map your data to a complexly trivial manifold before. Yeah. Sometimes you might not be able to do that. And but the point being is that you know to have the to learn the mapping is not 
necessarily from something set this game yeah, I mean, like, so people talk about like like spherical CNNs, and, and I still don't quite know what they mean because they'll always, whoever will mention this will always say, you can't actually cure this topological issue. So you can kind of do things like basically like forcing a bad point to go where you don't care about it, and then everything else basically just looks like, just looks like R2. Um, but I, I, I wish there were a more principled way of, of doing that. So to rephrase your auto encoder conclusion, are you just stating that you need to, it doesn't necessarily know what consummation is? is or mass um i guess your point is that if you don't impose conservation energy you fill in the, the sphere yeah. to a ball and then that's trivial yeah maybe maybe yeah yeah maybe that maybe that's one way to fix it you have to impose that constraint at some point no, no, i mean yeah yeah I, like yeah. obviously yeah. it would be ideal to impose it beforehand if you can right but yeah the, the question is when when yeah. can you impose yeah. It? yeah 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 that's a good yeah that's a good point Any other questions? Well, let's thank you for, for joining us. Yeah, so there's there's a upstairs component of called the reception, which will happen now um, in the I5 penthouse. So please join Yoni and friends. You're the friends. <laughs> Thank you.